So I have a few things that I've invented so far for our physics. And I like to keep them over here on the right side of the board. So I can use them to create new descriptions of my universe. The first thing that I have, I can't really write down, is the notion of position. I choose a coordinate system and now I can locate objects or events in my universe and I can name them with position that is a number. So I quantified the nature of my universe. But I recognize that mine is a universe of change and that objects can change their position. And so I define, for the purpose of describing that nature, the displacement, the final position minus the initial position. It's a very useful physics quantity because not only does it have a magnitude, a certain number of meters associated with the displacement, but also it can be positive or negative. A positive displacement means I've displaced in the positive direction and a negative displacement means I've displaced in the negative direction. Displacement is a vector quantity. And so I created from that the rate at which the displacement happens. And I, I admit that the quantity is only defined on average because displacement is defined according to where I start and where I finish. I don't know what happens in between. So it's sort of just an average of observing these things when I define the velocity, which is I'm writing V with a bar on top of it. The bar is reminding me that it's a quantity defined on average. The displacement divided by the time that it takes the displacement to happen. That's velocity by definition. Because it's defined in the context of displacement, and displacement is a vector, velocity is also a vector. When I have a positive velocity, I'm traveling in the positive direction. When I have a negative velocity, I'm traveling in the negative direction. So it's quite simple. Naturally, because displacement is measured in meters, time is measured in seconds, and velocity is measured in meters per second, the standard of units that we use to solve physics problems. I did a little bit of algebra with this to create a, a, perhaps a more useful version of the same equation. And what I derived was that the final position, that is some position in the future, is equal to whatever the position is now plus the average rate at which the position changes multiplied by time. That's the same equation. That's my definition of velocity simply written in a different way. One of the comments that I made about that equation is that it's really only temporary. I like it a lot, but only just for a bit. Later on, I'm going to abandon it in favor of a more sophisticated picture of my universe. Because like displacement and velocity, this equation does not account for all of that nonsense that might happen in between. I want to have a more precise description of my universe. But for now, that's what I'm working with. And so the game goes like this. I have a universe I'd like to describe, so I choose a coordinate system. I define all the positions. And I'm happy because I know the position of everything in the universe. Then I turn my back on the universe and everything changes position. Darn, I have to describe. The fact that my universe changes, transforms in the context of everything changing position. So I invent the idea of displacement. But then I realize that some things have greater displacements than others in the same amount of time. That is the rate at which they displace. Change is different from one object to another. So I need a way of describing the rate of change of displacement and so I have the velocity. And so now I observe the position of everything in the universe. I watch as the displacements happen. I compute from those displacements the velocities. And so maybe over here there's object A and it has a velocity and I compute what that velocity is. Displacement divided by time and I am content. Until I go out and I do it again and I observe A again and do displacement over time again and discover that its velocity has changed. Just like position, velocity can change over time. The velocity of a thing can become greater or lesser. The velocity of a thing can change direction. So in order to have a precise description of my universe, I now need a way to describe how velocity changes. And again, another familiar word, acceleration. A familiar colloquial word that you know means to speed up. In an automobile, I've got a pedal that I dis depress in order to make the car go faster. It's often referred to as the gas pedal, otherwise known as the accelerator. In our everyday language, accelerate generally means to go faster. I immediately have a change to that that I need to make. And that change is that the word acceleration in physics refers not only to going faster and faster, but also to going slower and slower, and also to changing direction. Acceleration is the term describing any change in velocity. Increasing, decreasing, or changing direction any change in velocity is acceleration. 
So if I describe an object which is slowing down, I would say the object accelerates. So there's a little bit of change in your thinking there in terms of how the word is used colloquially and how to be used in a physics sense. Acceleration. So now what I need is a definition for what is meant by acceleration. And again, I won't give a definition in terms of words. I'm going to give a definition in terms of an equation. I need a symbol for acceleration. Best possible choice. A, the acceleration. Lowercase a, mind you. So every once in a while you get students who want to use capital A, and I'm sorry, you can't do that. Lowercase a, the acceleration, is equal to, quite unsurprisingly, the change in the velocity divided by the time in which the velocity changes. If you're really following along at this point, you might think, oh, I'm in trouble. Because Shidley can do this day after day forever. I could come in tomorrow and I could say, well, now I look at my universe and now the, velo and now the accelerations change. Yeah, I could do that. Don't worry, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to stop with acceleration. We do sometimes go on. As a matter of fact, the rate at which the acceleration changes has a name just for fun. It's called the jerk. And the rate at which the jerk changes has a name. It's called the snap. But we're not going to worry about jerk and snap and anything that comes after that. I'll stop here with the rate at which the velocity changes. First thing off the bat, new thing defined. What are the units of it? The velocity has units of meters per second, and the time has units of second. That is a weird way of writing that, but sort of informative. Meters per second, per second. It's the number of meters per second by which an object's velocity changes in any given second. Meters per second, per second. And that's a little bit useful for the moment in my head to think about what it is that acceleration actually means, because like velocity and like displacement, it has a little bit of subtlety to it. You can't just plug and chug the equations and understand what it means. Once we understand it deeply, we'll think of this meters per second per second as being a bit inconvenient. And so we'll write it in a more convenient way as meters per second squared. Anytime I see a number that has with it dimensional units of meters per second squared, I know that's an acceleration. And you already have. Because when we talked about uncertainty, we dropped an object down the stairwell. I said that an object fell under the influence of gravity with an acceleration equal to 9.8 meters per second squared. So you've seen these units before. They appeared in front of that special number that I used associated with gravity for calculating the results of some experiment. Meters per second squared, the units of acceleration. Displacement is a vector. <clears throat> Displacement is a vector. That's why velocity is a vector. Because if displacement is a vector and velocity is defined in terms of displacement, then velocity is a vector. Acceleration is defined in terms of velocity, which is a vector, and so acceleration is a vector. Displacement can be positive or negative. That's why velocity can be positive or negative. And now, acceleration can be positive or negative. What does it mean? This is a dangerous moment in the development of your physics because your very first guess for what it means is wrong. You might guess, you say, well, it's obvious. <clears throat> if the acceleration is positive, it means I'm speeding up. And if the acceleration is negative, it means I'm slowing down. That is not correct. It seems like the obvious thing to do, but it is not correct. It's a very common mistake of physics. It does not account for the change in direction, Aaron, and that is really the point. Because not only does the velocity change, but the velocity changes for an object that may be traveling in the positive direction or may be traveling in the negative direction. Not to fear, because understanding how to interpret the sign of the acceleration is actually very easy to do. Just may not exactly be intuitive until you've trained yourself by solving some problems. Here's how it breaks down. If the acceleration is positive, and I'll indicate here just by writing positive like that. If the acceleration is positive, what it's saying is that you add, which is good because that's what the plus sign means to me, that you add velocity in each second. You add velocity. So if a thing is traveling at five meters per second, and it has an acceleration of one meter per second squared, that means you add one meter per second every second. One meter per second squared would mean one meter per second every second. So if I'm traveling at five meters per second, what would happen is five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
going faster and faster and faster. Isn't that lovely? Now, you might think about that description and say, yeah, it means the positive acceleration means that you're speeding up. No. How about this? What if I do the same thing except my velocity is now negative 5 meters per second squared and my acceleration is positive? I'm sorry. I misspoke. What if my velocity is negative 5 meters per second? I put the wrong units on it. What if my velocity is negative 5 meters per second and my acceleration is 1 meter per second squared? That means add 1 meter per second every second. But if my velocity is negative 5, then adding velocity means negative 5, negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1. A positive acceleration and slowing because I have a negative velocity. If I have a negative acceleration, so I'll signify here with a negative, that means I should subtract velocity in each second. A negative acceleration means subtract this many meters per second per second. So if I have an acceleration of negative one meters per second squared, and I'm traveling this way at five meters per second squared, then I subtract five, four, three, two, one. But Shelley, that means that a negative acceleration is slowing you down. Absolutely true. But consider if I'm going this way in the negative direction with a velocity of negative 5 meters per second and an acceleration of negative 1 meter per second squared. That means I have a negative velocity, but in every second I subtract velocity. So then what is it? Negative 5, negative 6, negative 7, negative 8, negative 9, faster and faster. So I can't think of the sign of acceleration as speeding up or slowing down. Terribly sorry, can't do it. But easily remedied because positive acceleration means add velocity in every second. Negative acceleration means subtract velocity in every second. An easy way to know, a shorthand for this, is a little thing we've been saying around here for years. And that is same sign speeding. It's a little shorthand for the details of this. Not much like an eye. Same sign speeding. If the velocity and the acceleration have the same sign, you're speeding up. If the velocity and the acceleration are both positive, you're speeding up. If the velocity and the acceleration are both negative, you're slowing down. Same sign speeding. I'm sorry. I think I misspoke just then. I'm going to say it again just to make sure. If the velocity and acceleration are both positive, then you're speeding up. If the velocity and acceleration are both negative, then you're speeding up. When they have the same sign, you're speeding up. But if the velocity and the acceleration have different signs, if one's positive and the other's negative, then you're slowing down. So all of this algebra associated with the vector sign of the acceleration can be explained in the context of simply same sign speeding. When the velocity and the acceleration have the same sign, you are speeding up. Otherwise, you are slowing down. That's just my definition of acceleration. Once I have a definition of acceleration, I'm inclined to uh, use it to do some calculations. And so what I'm going to do here is do the same thing I did for the velocity and do a little bit of algebra. You might recall a detail that I did uh, with displacement where I said, uh, well, with the definition of velocity rather, where the velocity was delta V over delta T. But I said, look, delta T is T minus T naught, and T naught is usually equal to zero. So I'm going to write the acceleration again over here. I'm going to write my definition. The acceleration is the change in velocity, but this time I'm going to write it divided by t, not delta t. Just because it's convenient for me, it makes for nice, compact, easy to use, easy to follow equations. So the acceleration is equal to delta v, and so what I'm going to do is a little bit of algebra here, and it's familiar algebra. I'll multiply both sides by t and flip it so that delta v, the change in velocity, is equal to the acceleration multiplied by the time. But of course, the change in velocity delta v is the final velocity minus the initial velocity would be equal to the acceleration times time. And what this gets me when I add the initial velocity to the other side of the equation is that the final velocity is equal to the initial velocity plus the acceleration times time. That is a standard equation. It is not like its companion here, x is equal to x naught plus v zero t, or I'm sorry, plus uh, v average times t. It's not temporary. This equation is a keeper. It is solid gold. When I finally get to the end of my discussion of motion, I'm going to keep that equation all the time. 
that equation worth memorizing. In order to make it easier to memorize this equation, I'll point out that it too is dimensionally consistent. That is, the units of velocity are meters per second. So here I have V in meters per second. The initial velocity also in meters per second. And the acceleration in meters per second squared multiplied by the time in seconds. And so you see here in the last term that the seconds cancel. And so I have meters per second is equal to meters per second plus meters per second. Dimensionally consistent equations describing the behavior. This equation provides the same wonderful service as its predecessor in that it predicts the future. The velocity at some time in the future is equal to whatever the velocity is now plus the average rate at which the velocity changes multiplied by the time that passes. I can use this equation to predict what velocities will be in the future. Now my physics is not just a description of the universe. Now my physics is a practical technique for creating technological advance. Being able to predict the velocity in the future makes it possible for me to be innovative with how I manipulate nature in order to do my bidding. This here looks horrible. I just want to redraw this. Now in terms of my definition of acceleration, I'm done. I think I did a pretty good job of describing the acceleration, how it behaves. Of course, we won't understand it perfectly until we practice it a bit. Well, well, naturally, I'm going to give you an opportunity to practice. But there's one more thing that I want to add on to this discussion. Speed things up a little bit. It is a powerful tool of our physics, and in fact, all of our science, really, if I'm being honest, to make graphs that describe the behavior of physical systems. Since we're talking about motion, kind of graphs that I'm referring to here are motion graphs. There are three facts about looking at graphs of motion that I'd like you to be aware of. They're extraordinarily powerful because it makes it possible for me to make measurements of velocity and measurements of position and make graphs of my experimental data and from those graphs interpret the natural behavior. So three graph facts coming your way. Three graph facts. Beginning. With using a little bit of imagination, consider that I've done an experiment where I've collected data regarding the position of an object x as a function of time t. And my graph starts out at t is equal to zero here on the horizontal axis and an initial position x naught here on the y axis. That's what the initial position means. It's the position when the time is equal to zero. And let's imagine that I collect some data so that I have an initial position and a final position over here. Now, that's a pretty weak graph. We're used to seeing scientific studies where there's data all over the place. I just have a single point on my graph, a single data, well, two points technically. I have the initial position x naught and the final position x. But that's all I need to calculate displacement. I just need two measurements of position. I'm off to the races. Perhaps it would be more fun if I had more data. Probably would suggest that we do that. But with these two points, all I can do is imagine that they're connected with a line, thusly. That's all I can do is connect them with a line. That's all the analysis, because I don't know what happened in between. It's a mystery. But I want to make an observation about this, this graph that may seem simplistic. I apologize. But I want to make an observation with this graph, and the observation is this. If I calculate the slope of this graph, and we all know from our math classes that the way that I calculate a slope is to take the rise of the graph and divide it by the run of the graph. Slope is rise over run. I'll take the rise of the graph and divide it by the run of the graph. And the way that I do that is seeing how far does it run along the, what would formerly be the x-axis, but in this case the time axis. And the answer there is t. And how far does it go along the vertical axis, in this case the x-axis, delta x. So along the horizontal axis it goes t, that's the run, delta x is the rise. So the slope of this graph is delta x divided by t. And I've just made a revelation, realized something extraordinarily important. The first of three graph facts. That the slope of the position time graph is velocity on average. And that's useful because it's true here in the simplest position graph imaginable, but now it is true for all position graphs. It is true for all position graphs. The slope of a position time graph is velocity. If the slope is very steep, 
the velocity is very high. If the slope is shallow, then the velocity is low. If the slope is zero, that's a horizontal line, right? If the slope is zero, the velocity is zero. If the slope is negative, the velocity is negative. By looking at the slope of a, of a position time graph, I can determine what the velocity is. Maybe I don't calculate it from looking at the graph, but I can tell the times on the graph where the velocity is greater or lesser. I can tell from the graph when the velocity is positive or negative, according to the first of three graph facts, that the slope of the position time graph is velocity. Now I'm going to make another graph in order to get my second of three graph facts. This is the velocity as a function of time now. And imagine I do an experiment where I calculate some velocities. By the way, getting the velocity is a bit trickier because in order to make a position, uh, um, a velocity measurement, I have to uh, do two position measurements. So if I want to get two velocity measurements, it actually requires four position measurements in order to get that. But my velocity experiment involves, at t is equal to zero, measuring some initial velocity that I call v0. They're on my vertical axis. And then at some time later, I measure a final velocity v, and that point is out here on the axis of at a time t. So I only have two points of data, the initial velocity and the final velocity. All I can do is connect them with a straight line. And I'm curious, what would be the slope, and hopefully, if you're following along, you're beginning to get the hang of what it is I'm doing here, what would be the slope of this graph? That is, the rise of this graph divided by the run of this graph, what does it reveal? Well, in order to calculate the run of the graph, I'm going to have to go along the horizontal axis here, and that run is the amount of time that the experiment runs for. And along the vertical axis, that's going to be the change in the velocity along the vertical axis. And so if I calculate the slope by rise over run, that's the change in velocity divided by the time in which the velocity changes. I know what that is. That slope is equal to acceleration. The second of three graph facts the slope of a velocity time graph is the acceleration. And again, it's excellent because now it works for any velocity time graph. And if the graph is very steep, then the acceleration is large. If the graph is shallow, then the acceleration is small. If the graph is horizontal, that is, if it has a slope of zero, then the acceleration is zero. If the slope is negative, then the acceleration is negative. Just by looking at a graph of data, a velocity is a function of time. And observing the slope, I can determine the nature of the acceleration of the system. It's a very powerful thing. It's a very powerful Third graph fact. See, I know what's going to happen. You're going to make a graph of acceleration as a function of time. I'm not going to make a graph of acceleration as a function of time. Instead, I'm going to once again make a graph of velocity as a function of time. And this one I'm going to make very, very simple. Because I'm just going to say that there's the same velocity the whole time. The velocity never changes. The velocity is a horizontal line. That means the acceleration is equal to zero, by the way, because I know from the second graph fact that when I draw a graph of velocity as a function of time, the slope of that graph is the acceleration. If the slope is zero, then the acceleration is zero. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Because acceleration is the change in velocity. If an object's sitting still, then its velocity is not changing. So my velocity here is a horizontal line. I'm going to do something really quirky, a little bit strange. I'm going to calculate, instead of a slope, I'm going to calculate this area, this rectangular area, under the velocity graph, above the time axis, from time is equal to zero until time is equal to t. And I'm going to compute the area. And of course, I'm doing it because a little bit of a mystery will be revealed. When I compute the area of this thing, I'm going to do the length multiplied by the width. That's how you compute the area. But that area is going to be velocity multiplied by time. Because it's a rectangular area on the vertical axis, it's velocity. On the horizontal axis, it's time. So the length of that rectangle times the width of that angle is the velocity times time, which I've already realized by this equation here. I manipulate it, multiply velocity over to the other side of the equation. This is equal to delta x. On a graph of velocity as a function of time, third graph fact, the area under the velocity time graph is displacement. The area under a velocity time graph is displacement. In this case that I've drawn here on the board, the displacement is positive because the area is positive. Shadi, the area is always positive. Well, that used to be the case. Not so anymore. The area could be negative. It's not in my example here, but the area could be negative if the velocity graph went under the time axis. Then the velocity would be negative. Area under the time axis is negative displacement. Area above the time axis is positive displacement. 
displacement. Three graph facts that you are expected to know. The slope of the position time graph is velocity. The slope of the velocity time graph is acceleration. And the area under the acceleration as a function of time graph is displacement.